Hi, this is Mike Power, President and CEO of Silver Range Resources, and this is a short presentation on our Hanapaw project. First, a quick word from our lawyers. Hanapaw is located 28 kilometers east of Tonopah. It's at the southern end of the Monitor Range where Highway 6 uh, heads out of the valley towards Ely. It's readily accessible uh, from Highway 6. You can get across much of the property in a two-wheel drive, but a four-wheel drive is necessary to get everywhere. There's quite an extensive road network on the property. The uh, Hanapaw project is a joint venture between Mercury Exploration Nevada Inc. and Silver Range. It consists of uh, 55 claims in two blocks. The property is staked on forest service land and a portion of it, uh, it lies in roadless rural land. Here's a map of workings in the project area. The most significant showings where there have been some high grading are shown with the uh, purple stars, but there are numerous other workings in the area. The interesting thing about this is that the workings aren't uh, following a single trend or even a couple of them. They're widely distributed, suggesting that there are multiple mineralized structures in the area. Hanapaw was discovered about 1870, shortly after the discovery of silver at uh, Belmont in 1865. There was a shipment in 1871 of uh, about a ton of uh, pretty high grade material recorded from Hanapaw, but the district was pretty quiet thereafter until the discovery of silver in Tonopah around 1900. 1902, the Hanapaw Mining and Smelting Company was formed after Samuel Newhouse and his partners out of Salt Lake uh, visited the district. They bought uh, claims on what became the Hanapaw Mine. And they worked there from uh, 1902 through 1907. They sunk two shafts, an inclined and vertical shaft, built some plant to surface, uh, made a few small shipments, and uh, everything was going swimmingly until the uh, all the surface workings caught fire in 1907 and burned to the ground. And that was the end of the Hanapaw Mining and Smelting Company. The property lay dormant, uh, with some high grading and poking around in the general area until the 1920s. Uh, in 1927, Chester Bunker, a uh, Texas oil man, showed up with his modestly named World Exploration Company, and there was a flurry of activity between the fall of 1927 and uh, spring of uh, 1928. They uh, extended the two shafts. They also optioned the adjoining uh, Ben Richardson mine, more about that later, which they called the Hanapaw Extension. Uh, they uh, sank the shafts, encountered water as the previous uh, developers had, and spent a lot of time fighting that, bringing in large Cornish pump in February of 1928. Um, built a lot of surface workings, had a crew working there. Uh, it made some small shipments, but by about May, uh, definitely the the writing was on the wall. A manager quit, and uh, in later in the month, uh, the compressor blew up, and they could no longer pump the mines. And that's about the last we heard of the World Exploration Company. They were gone shortly thereafter. In uh, 1907, Ben Richardson staked uh, the what became the Richardson Mine. It adjoins the Hanapaw uh, Mine. And uh, it's probably one of the longer lived uh, producers in the district. Ben worked on this from 1907 through uh, 1935 off and on, as well as in other projects throughout the district. He was a, a prolific high grader. Much of the uh, uh, recorded production in the district that we can be sure of, uh, it was by Ben Richardson. Uh, his wife, uh, Elma, joined him in 1914 and the two of them worked together as a team. During the 1920s, uh, he made uh, numerous shipments from the Ben Richardson mine, which led World Exploration to option the property briefly, and then they turned it back. And he mined in the district until 1935, when unfortunately tragedy struck. He got uh, caught in the hoist of his mine, was very badly injured, and subsequently died of his injuries. His wife, Alma, continued uh, managing the properties until the 1950s. At the north uh, west end of the district is the Silver Glance uh, property. It was discovered by a bunch of prospectors in 1905, and they uh, high graded away there until 1907, uh, reportedly shipping uh, quite a substantial volume of ore, but we get that story from a mining promoter who picked the property up later. In 1907, uh, the property was sold to promoters from Goldfield who formed the Silver Glance Mining Company, which operated for two years before uh, disappearing, uh, made a couple of small shipments. Thereafter, one of the owners of the mine, uh, Mark Bradshaw, consolidated 
uh, ownership of the Silver Glance property in his own hands. And in 1930, he went back to work. He had a crew of 10 working in there in the winter of 1930, and they uh, sank a shaft down to 140 feet. There's no recorded production. And uh, the Silver Glance Mining Company uh, disappeared into the mists of time. In uh, terms of modern exploration, since the 1990s, a number of firms have uh, worked in the area, Kinross, uh, Wolfpack Gold, uh, Frontier, which is now Liberty Gold, uh, and Seabridge. Uh, so it's, it was interest to some big companies. The only drilling we found in the area are some vertical holes like to drill by Kinross looking for another round mountain. And in 2017, the property uh, became open and uh, Silver Range staked the Ben Richardson mine and claims to the east and then later Mercury, Nevada, uh, came in and staked in the district, and uh, we joined forces and optioned the property to infield resources in uh, 2019. Uh, I've got the property back, and it's back on the market. Here's the geologic setting. Hanapaw is in the Oligocene ignorate flare-up belt through uh, central Nevada. It's an area covered by uh, largely ash flow tufts and uh, minor volcanics. Uh, the basement rock are Paleozoic carbonates. The most interesting feature with respect to the regional geology is, is the Cowich Toyabi liniment. This is a approximately 80 kilometer long uh, structure defined by uh, faults mapped at surface and some air photo liniments. Could be a strike clip fault, could be a normal fault. In any event, it extends from the Reveille Range on the east uh, to the uh, southern monitor range and uh, has this interesting deflection to the more to the north more about later the important thing about the Kawachoyabi liniment is it seems to localize gold and silver mineralization in this part of western nevada um, there these are uh, gold and silver camps that are distributed along the length of the Kawachoyabi liniment from the reveille belt in the east where uh, vr resources exploring uh, silver range has recently optioned the bell helen uh, camp uh, an old silver camp the uh, Ellendale district is being explored by infield resources, and we have Hanapaw uh, at the western end, a little off trend. More about that in a minute. Zooming into the regional geology, uh, the area, is, as I said, is underlain by uh, tufts and ignimbrites. There are a couple of small uh, outliers of Paleozoic rocks here, but for the most part, these are Oligocene, Miocene volcanics. At property scale, uh, what we know is that the property appears to be underlain by a network of uh, west-northwest trending uh, faults, steeply dipping faults from what we can see. Uh, and these cut the uh, Oligocene to earliest Miocene tufts and ignimbrites and volcanic rocks that are in the area. Here's what the mineralization looks like. We're in a low sulfidation system with quartz veins hosted in faults and fractures. It's fairly high level. You see the nice opalescent sample at the bottom. Uh, at surface, the mineralization's uh, generally quite weathered. You see quartz, limonite, gertite, uh, some clays, all the sulfides are gone. But at depth uh, within the mines and on some of the dumps, you can find uh, samples with quartz pyrite and uh, polybasite, uh, silver antimony. Uh, sulfide, and that carries most of the silver in the district. And silver is dominant. There's a little bit of gold, but this is a silver district. Finally, oxidation uh, is to a depth of about uh, 20 meters in the mines, and the water tables at about 60 meters. This map shows silver assays from chip and grab samples collected both on the property and in the adjacent areas. And you can see there's some pretty good numbers here, basically from two to 600 grams per ton silver from surface samples. There's some gold associated with it, mostly in the southeast portion of the property where we collected samples up to 2.9 grams per ton. The interesting thing about the silver mineralization is that it's both extensive along strite and widespread. It looks like there's a large system bleeding silver into these rocks. Could there be a bigger target here? Let's zoom back out and have a look at this Cowich Toyabi liniment again. As I pointed out, it's likely a major plumbing feature, whether a dip slip or a normal fault, that tends to localize uh, low sulfidation gold and silver mineralization along its 80 kilometer length. But there's a problem with it. Look at the west end. The fault suddenly veers off to the north and just dies out in the middle of nowhere. It's quite strong there as well. This isn't how major strike slip or dip slip faults die. 
Instead, they generally end in horsetail zones. These are areas where the fault splits up into a number of splays and, and minor displacements taken up along each, allowing the fault to terminate. These are great areas in modern settings to look for geothermal uh, resources because they form zones where you can get hot fluids upwelling from depth. Now, low sulfidation epithermal gold and silver deposits are essentially fossil geothermal systems. So horsetail zones are also an excellent spot to go looking uh, for these kinds of deposits. So what might be missing? Let's zoom back into the Hanapau area. Here's the Cowich Soyabi liniment. We think there's a bunch of horsetail faults in this area that haven't been completely identified in the geologic mapping. Is there any evidence for this? We think there is. This is a plot of alteration mineralogy generated from analysis of Aster satellite remote sensing imagery. It shows uh, the uh, Alunite, kaolinite, and white mica channels, alunite being alunite, perophyllite, dickite, the kaolinite both primary and secondary, and the white mica channels basically eolite through montmorillonite, uh, showing them up as three to colors mixed, and the uh, with the faults here as well, just for reference. Now, the fascinating thing we see in this diagram is there's a whole series of southeast to northwest trending structures through here. You can see these liniments defined by the brighter colors. These are areas of bedrock alteration. These features cut across topography. You can see here where material is being shed down slope. They're true bedrock features and uh, likely represent uh, an altered uh, fault and fracture system. So here's a, the evidence we were looking for of a horsetail fault system that's accommodating all the uh, displacement at the end of the Cowich Toyabi liniment. Now this is of more than scientific interest because at the southeast end we have the Ellendale high-grade gold camp, here's Hanapah, and finally off to the northwest we have the Midway deposit. So these structures appear to be significant controllers of mineralization in the area. So there's a happy highway between that bend in the couch Soyabi liniment and the area off to the northwest. Zooming back into the Hanapah project, here are the principal producers on a satellite image. The target at Hanapah is a structurally controlled low sulfidation uh, epithermal silver system, likely controlled in a series of steeply dipping faults, probably more than the three we show here. If a bunch of them are clustered together, there might be a uh, open pitable bulk tonnage target as well. So that's what we're looking for at Hanapah. Okay, so what's next? Well, we've got to find those faults. And fortunately, there's a tool for that. We intend to use high frequency frequency domain electromagnetic surveys or max min or equivalent to map fine structure. We'll supplement this with alteration mapping, some detailed geologic mapping and soil geochem surveys to identify which of them might be most fertile. We'll be looking at peripheral targets too, because as you saw, this is a big system. We'll have to get started early on permitting because this is forest service land after all. But in the end, we think we'll be able to come up with some compelling drill targets and permits to drill them. We're also looking for a partner who wants to get in on the ground floor. So there's lots more to come from Hanapa. Stay tuned.